So welcome. Today we have a very special guest on the podcast. I am personally super excited. This is someone I consider a friend, an amazing, just an amazing person. So today we have Molly, Molly Hunash. Got so excited. <laughs> um, so she is our associate director of MCAT here at Jack Weston. She is in charge of all things fantastic. So she heads our um, content department. She heads our live instruction department. She is also a fantastic CARS instructor and helps train folks. She really just is a jack of all trades, does everything. Um, and we could not be more excited to have you on today's podcast. I am so excited. I have been a listener since day one. <laughs> um, I absolutely love it. I love working with you and I love working with Phil. And I love that you described me as a jack of all trades. Just <laughs> given the name of the company, it's, that's it's not it's intentional. So perfect. I know. And that's what made it better. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've got my hands in content. I, I do some teaching, right? I love working with our instructors. Um, it's honestly just so such a fun place to work because I get to meet such amazing people, right? I get to to hang out with, with you and with Phil and uh, everyone here is such a gem. Um, but I am, I am so excited. My first podcast episode, look it up. <laughs> I think you get paid to say nice things. I think that's your actual job. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, no, I don't think but, so. Yeah, I, so. I get paid to be honest and to help people improve their MCAT scores. That's exactly that's what I'll call my job description. <laughs> and I know you share a lot of the the same things that Phil and I share in terms of not just studying for the MCAT, succeeding on the MCAT, and then getting into med school and doing well in medical school, just having that big picture and that growth mindset, which is so important, which is why we're really excited that today we get to hear about how you studied for the MCAT, what you think went well, what you think you could have done better, what you wish you would have known. Because I know a lot of students, you know, they they don't always know where to start. And so hearing other people's experiences can be really helpful in terms of what to take away that's positive and also what they can avoid doing um, so that they don't run into the same issues we ran into. Yes. And I am happy to be a poster child for not a very um, linear, logical study plan. <laughs> um, so I've got lots of I fell into a lot of traps that I'm sure um, a lot of your listeners are are dealing with um, mm -hmm. at the moment, right? So I'm hoping that, you know, I could share the things that I did that helped me and the things that mm -hmm. maybe didn't serve me so well. Um, and obviously now working with students constantly um, and brainstorming a lot of things that I wish I would have done and that I think if I had done them, my life would have been a lot easier. <laughs> um so I, I love I love being able to chat about this. Super exciting. So tell us a little bit about when you tested, what your overall timeline looked like. Yeah. So <laughs> I I plan to take the test in April. Um, and I did test in April. Um, and I started really thinking about the MCAT um pretty much December prior to, to actually taking my exam. Good. Um, now that being said, I didn't really do anything useful for about a month. Um, I knew that I wanted to take my test and, you know, I had my, uh, my mind set on an April test date. Um, but you know, I, I had a hard time motivating myself to get started mm -hmm. motivation. And also I had no idea how to get started. Mm -hmm. Um, I had basically, you know, very few other friends at the time that were studying for the MCAT that were in this process. I took a gap year after my um, graduation. So I felt really far removed from other pre-meds that were going through the same thing as me. Um, and probably like a lot of you guys, right? The number one place I went to was our MCAT, right? <laughs> I was all over the Reddit, which... It was a really, a really helpful place for me because I got to connect with other people that were doing this alongside me. Um, but <laughs> I definitely fell into the trap of picking up someone else's study plan <laughs> and trying to make it work. As I have you heard other people do this too, because I certainly yeah. have. So I also 
Um, actually, with with the MCAT, I tried that. I very quickly realized that was not going to work. But yep. I also tried that with other exams in med school and just saying, OK, <laughs> I'm going to like this person. They did really well. Like I'm going to take their their study uh, study plan for the exam that I took last month. That that did not work out. It took me a little longer to admit that it wasn't going to work out than it took me to admit that for the MCAT. But yeah, people do it all the time, right? People post like, okay, this is what worked for me. And then other people adopt it. And there's that, that is a tricky situation. How did it go for you? Yeah. Um, it didn't go well. (laughs) I feel like that's probably the, the most common response to that question. How was it taking on someone else's study plan? Um, but it's so tempting. Mm-hmm. And it's it's honestly comforting to hear that even someone as amazing as Azai has been tempted <laughs> by this because it's really easy to get caught up. You yeah. know, you hear someone did so well, they get the score that you want, right? I think the, the person that I ended up uh, taking their study plan, I think they got like a 526 or something like that. And like, my life would be completely different if I if I could get a score like that. That would change the game. So many doors would open for me And, you know, the temptation of this person has to know what they're doing if they got that score. Um, I should just do what they did. And hopefully, you know, following their advice, I'll get the score that I want. Um, It's so easy to fall into that trap because it feels like they have more information than you do, (laughs) you know. Um, But for me, at least, and as I maybe for you too, right, I've got a very specific set of strengths and weaknesses that ultimately you need to be part of your study plan, right? Ultimately, what was tricky for me was not the same as what was tricky for the student who studied and got a 526 and uh, however many months they did. I think it was a three-month study plan. Um, And so when I was trying to take my learning style, my strengths and my weaknesses and force it into this study plan that someone else had written, it didn't work for me. Um, it, I very quickly felt frustrated because in the study plan, this particular student had um, had scheduled a lot of time to review biology and biochemistry because there's a lot of content in there. But I, at the time, had been teaching biology and biochemistry for, uh, I guess, then like three years. Like that was easy for me. And I was like, well, yeah. they did it, so I should do it. Um, and I didn't need to spend all that time. Right. For me, my physics and, and chemistry and in my undergrad experience were pretty gnarly. Right. So I should have devoted more time to making sure that I felt mentally and emotionally prepared to deal with that section of the exam. Right. It it wasn't set up in a way that was benefiting me. Um yeah. so I had to <laughs> I had to reformulate my approach like two weeks in, uh, maybe a little less than that. Um, but I had to jump ship personally. I like that you mentioned even just like as quickly as content review, adopting someone else's study scheduler. And like you said, you not having a say in your own study schedule can be problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Because like you, I felt a lot more comfortable with bio biochem. We had... We had a non-bio pre-med track at, at U Chicago, and I felt like the bio biochem classes did a really great job of preparing us. But like you, chem phys, orgo, not so much. <laughs> had, to, had to really struggle with those. And yeah, and so that's like that's important. If you know where your content weaknesses are, you can target those. And I feel like I, I feel like I'm broken record sometimes because I keep saying it. I say it in free trial sessions. I say it on the podcast. I say it in the course. Um, but a weakness is just a strength you haven't cultivated yet, right? But you need to know what yours are, and they're not going to be the same as the person next to you. And so that's where. And actually, I'm just going to do a quick plug for a free resource that we have on the web page on Jack Weston, uh, the Jack Weston homepage, and that's our content diagnostic tool. So that is for the sciences. You can go in, answer questions. They're not AMC style because the goal is to identify what topics you are weak in. Whereas we've mentioned this on the podcast a bajillion times, but the way the AMC is ultimately going to test you on content is through relationships and application. But so you're going to have, you know, often different layers to a single question. But first, you've got to know what content do I need to study? Right. And what what should I spend more time on, less time on? Um, And I suspect folks that have been out of out of undergrad for a year or more, like in your case, that is going to change 
based off of also if you've been, you know, if you've been away longer and weren't teaching those those content areas, um, you might have multiple areas that you need to work very heavily on. Yeah. And I love that you bring that up, especially because personally, um, when I was just getting started studying, first of all, I wish that we had something like the diagnostic. Right. And a little plug for a, a, a complimentary free resource is the analytics page. You do the diagnostic and not only do you see like, ah, oh, you got 50% right in the chemistry physics section. Like it will tell you very specific, like, yo, you're not so good at fluid dynamics, like go study, right? Or, hey, you know, you did fantastic in metabolism, right? It'll tell you specifically, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but personally, um, for example, physics in undergrad for me was, I didn't, I didn't have, teachers who really cared about it that actually wanted to teach. I went to a research-based institution. A lot of my professors were there because they got research uh, grants. So they weren't necessarily people that love to teach. And and for me, physics was pretty traumatic. Like I I just felt like I would never get it coming into the MCAT. um, And while ultimately I was creating my more DIY plan (laughs) after (laughs) trying and failing the Reddit plan, um, I was certain that I was going to spend at least two out of three of my months of studying just on physics Um, Mm. and doing um, doing a full length. Right. I did the sample test at the beginning just to get a sense of what the MCAT looked like. Um, I was shocked because I thought physics was my worst subject in all of it, but I actually did okay on the physics section. It was actually um, I think it was gen chem and o chem that had had been longer removed for me so while i was making my study plan i was so glad that i i had taken something like that because i actually i thought i was pretty good at chem and i thought i was terrible at physics and it surprised me because i was actually better at physics than i thought i did at least physics in the mcat uh scope so doing things like that you guys can't plug that enough because you might not be as bad at the things that you think you're awful at, and you might need to revisit some of the <laughs> topics that you think you're great at. Um, yeah. So using these resources early on, is so, so useful. And this is where data, data oh. is your friend. <laughs> Do not go based off of feeling, not <laughs> for the MCAT. You know, this, you can have feelings about the MCAT, but you can't be guided by those feelings. And it's the same thing, you know, we say this with cars, right? You can have opinions, but you got to leave them at the, at the door. Um, It's kind of Mm -hmm. the same thing when you're, when you're approaching what content to study, you've got to take the facts that are in front of you um, and use those to, to your advantage. So what did you mention kind of your own DIY plan? What did that look like? Um, so basically when I was trying to sit down and do this, grabbing the content and skills breakdown from the, the sample test that I had done mm-hmm. helped me figure out what areas I needed to work on. Um, I wish again, that I had something like the content diagnostic, because ultimately I'm sure you guys have talked about this on, on the podcast before, but there are so many reasons why you miss a, an MCAT question. Oh yeah. There are so many right? And little plug for data, collecting data on yourself. If you are someone who gets terrified of research design and data interpretation, (laughs) become the researcher, right? (laughs) Research your own strengths and weaknesses. Um, Make, you know, research figures from your own data. See if it's uh, calculation questions always trip me up or uh, data interpretation when there's a table. Oof, I need work, right? Um, Taking those factors away and trying to understand, okay, what what content areas do I need to fill? That was my first step as far as like my DIY study plan, trying to build out priorities of um, not just which content areas for me were weakest, but also looking at the number of questions Mm -hmm. that came from those different content areas so that I was prioritizing the things I was most likely to see on the test. I was I was surprised by the distributions of the content areas that that really are tested. Um, so definitely make sure you're learning about the exam before you are creating your plan. I'll give you a, a little uh, insider tip: physics, 
not as important for the MCAT as biology or biochemistry. <laughs> Probably everyone knows that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, bio, biochem, it's not limited to the bio, biochem section. You get some of that mm. thrown in in the chemistry physics section. Um, so, and, and like you're saying, this, what you've touched on is just this high yield, right? You were mm -hmm. taking a look at what your weakest areas were, but also what was high yield and considering them together when making your study plan, which is fantastic. Um, that's what we, you know, we're always, we're always telling you guys that that's the way to go about it because that's how you're going to make sure that you get the most, the, the most increase and the most bang for your buck for studying every time you review an exam. And in case you haven't already heard it, we had a podcast recently about how to review a full length exam effectively. Go listen to it yes. <laughs> um, after after this one, if you haven't already, because you can honestly start applying those things, even when you're reviewing a practice passage, the things that we talked about. So I want to encourage you guys to take a listen to that if you haven't already. Yeah, absolutely. I, Phil and Azai, your your guidance for students is unparalleled. It's <laughs> it's a it's really amazing. Definitely go listen. Um, and yeah, basically, as you're integrating practice questions into your prep, reviewing is the most important. Um, personally, I'm getting ahead of myself because I did not do a ton of practice questions before I started my content review. Although I did use the Jack Weston cars passages. <laughs> um, I got started on cars early. And I will tell everyone listening, it was probably my best decision while prepping for the MCAT. Get started on cars now. Even if you are a, you know, sophomore, a freshman, uh, you know, thinking, oh, maybe I want to study for the MCAT, you know, next year, the year after, it's never too early for cars. <laughs> and as I, we could probably sit here and talk about cars for the oh, next yeah. six hours. Oh yeah, we both have so much to say. But if you want to learn more about cars, you go hop into his eyes free trial session. You'll <laughs> you'll learn everything you need to know. Um, but getting exposed to that so important early, so you can start figuring out how to distance yourself from passage content and how to take arguments at face value with just the things that the author presents, um, and all of those super fun skills that you'll build while, while prepping for cars. So, so that, that was kind of the early phase. What about as you moved through and, and started studying? Yeah. So I prioritized my content areas and then my goal was to figure out, okay, how am I going to learn this stuff effectively? Um, so I, I had my priorities list of different content areas I wanted to hit, but Personally, I struggled a lot with finding good resources to use. Um, so I was one of pretty much every pre-med <laughs> that has ever started studying for the MCAT, right? The first thing I did was I bought a set of textbooks to use and review. Um, I'm not going to name drop anyone, um, <laughs> but I will say that um, although I love reading, I've always loved reading, it was not it was not a very effective way for me to learn. Um, and the reason was, is I was so trained during undergrad to memorize, mm. right? That's how I had succeeded in undergrad. Um, and, and I personally am not super great at memorization. So mm. it, it, it took a lot of work, you know, to memorize and get every little detail done. Um, and when I was staring at the content review books, which thousands of pages long, um, they're not necessarily they're not necessarily written in a way that highlights this is an incredibly important point and this is a something you may see but probably not um and without that sort of direction and without that sort of context or at least of seeing someone explain it to me and to tell the depth um i was writing down everything i was expecting that i was supposed to know every little detail um and that was that was tricky for me because when I started to integrate questions, I learned very quickly that this is not the way that the AMC will test you. It's not an undergrad exam. Um, it's it's so much heavier in the understanding, right? We call it the conceptual learning, right? Versus like memory-based learning. Um, I have a hard time just shoving facts in my brain, but if I understand how one thing interacts with another, or I understand why the sympathetic nervous system has the effects that it does on your body, right? When I start to understand like, oh, the body is an amazing system and everything connects, 
right? Even understanding that physics and chemistry and biology and psychology and sociology are all just different scopes of the same thing, um, you know, zoomed in or zoomed out, um, it started to click, right? And that I think was a huge turning point for me in my prep. I started to realize you don't need to memorize every fact in a in a textbook, right? What you need to do is understand the connections. Yeah. It changes everything. I had such a similar experience. I also bought a, a textbook set and not the best investment I could have made <laughs> at all. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> most of those books after the first like week, maybe week and a half that I, I gave them, um, they didn't really get touched, which yeah. was frustrating because, you know, I was, I was paying for my stuff. I was working to pay for my things. And I was like, yeah. I just dropped, you know, a couple hundred dollars on a set of books that I will not use. And so I would have rather spent that money elsewhere. Um, and honestly, just doing something more, more effective because they just sat there and I eventually, you know, resold them for like a fraction of what I paid for them. But it was, I was actually having dinner with, with some friends a couple weeks ago and they, one of them didn't know what I, what I do for work and didn't know that I am still immersed in the world of MCAT. Um, and when they found out, we ended up just, you know, talking a little bit about how, how we studied and our experiences, because people do not tend to remember the MCAT fondly, quite frankly. Mm. Um, and one of the things <laughs> was everybody had bought books and none of us used the books. None of us. And so it's it's this kind of, it's almost like a rite of passage to yes. buy books that you don't use. And, you know, yeah. it's it's something that many of us have actually, when when we came to med school, we've stopped doing that. You know, we've we've eventually picked up on how we learn. And for most of us, it's not textbooks because they're not active. It's it's like you said, it's just memorization, hard to prioritize what's more important, the connections. And really, the MCAT's all about those connections. And so that's why we've encouraged you guys, you know, and I know you you do this in the course and um, like for students mm -hmm. that are in the course and also during free trial sessions. It's not just about memorization. It's about you know, piecing together content and different topics and seeing how different topics relate to each other. And I know one thing that I love, and I suspect if I remember correctly, you do too, is review sheets or study guides, making them. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a great way to, to start making those connections. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially when you make your own, yes. you know, making your own study resources, Yes, I know it's easier to use a pre-made resource, a pre-made flashcard deck or a pre-made equation sheet or whatever, but nothing will substitute you doing it yourself. Um, and right, if you think of active versus passive learning, which I'm sure you've heard these terms before, I'm sure that you've you've had professors bring them up. Maybe you guys have even talked about it on the podcast, right? Probably a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Making your own resources is basically the most active way that you could physically study, right? Because you're synthesizing information on your own, compiling the things that you learned and then thinking to myself, for my own brain, what is the best way that I could represent this on paper, right? Or what's the best way that I could cue myself to retrieve that factor, that concept that, that I just learned, right? So all of this to say personalizing things to yourself is such a crucial aspect of getting like meaningful improvements in scores, right? You got to figure out how you learn best and how you learn is going to be different from how I learn, which is probably different from how I learns. And that <laughs> is beautiful and it's amazing. Um, but focusing on the connections, the things that are similar, right? Between different content areas or even between the way that you learn and how a friend learns, right? That's those are some really key um, pieces of information, even for the context of psychology. Um, and just as a plug, if you've got friends that are also studying for the MCAT or you have people that aren't, try and chat with them. One of the best ways to build a conceptual understanding of a topic is to get exposed to it however you are, whether it's watching lecture videos in the course or hanging out with us in live sessions um, or maybe coming to a free trial session, reading a textbook, watching YouTube videos, however you learn information, go try and explain it to somebody. <laughs> go see if they can understand after you've explained it. Um, it's such a great way to, to test understanding because you've got to explain it in a way that makes sense to that person. You may need to explain it a couple different ways for it to click. Um, and thinking of how you could explain it multiple different ways 
really cements it in your brain. Um, And that actually, that brings up a funny story for me. Um, While I was studying for my MCAT, um, I I also was working the whole time as I I feel you on the Kaplan book. Oh, the something book, (laughs) whatever book you want. Actually, the different one. (laughs) Okay, okay. I told you guys I wasn't going to name drop and here I go accidentally blurting it out. Um, The textbook dilemma. I thought I needed the brand new, uh, you know, most recent version. I also never used them after the first couple of weeks, <laughs> except now I use them as a, a desk razor. Like no. I'll, I'll track my <laughs> iPad while I'm teaching. I like to draw on my iPad. So my, my drawings are a little bit more legible for my students in sessions. Mm-hmm. I use it to bring my iPad closer to my face. Because <laughs> they're so tall. <laughs> that it's actually provides a, a valuable amount of lift for my devices. So actually I do use my textbooks, just not in the way that I thought I would. Um, and it's I love for it. $300, I could probably find a better product, but you know, I pay oh, yeah. for it. I'll use it. I'll use it. Um, but, you know, explaining things to friends, um, unmatched, unrivaled, and actually what I was doing at that time during my gap year to pay for the insert other uh, competitor books, <laughs> um, I actually was teaching um, and I was teaching not college, not MCAT, but um, elementary, middle and high school students. Uh, these were gifted students um, in like a special academy, um, but they were learning a lot of the things that I was learning for the MCAT. So it was a really fun job for me at that time, because my question was, how do I explain glycolysis to an eighth grader? How do I make this meaningful to them? Like, how can I present this information so it's not scary and so that it clicks for someone who has an entirely different perspective from me? And that exercise, I think, really helped me solidify my understanding of a lot of these really key MCAT concepts. Why weren't you my middle and high school teacher? Honestly, why weren't you my undergrad instructor? I feel oh my like gosh. I would have, especially if, if you had felt comfortable with chemistry and physics, mm-hmm. I feel like your teaching style would have been fantastic for my learning style. Um, so our, our core students are honestly really blessed and really lucky to have oh. you and Phil as, as their instructors, quite frankly. Um, oh, the way, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, I think the way that information is presented is really important. Um, and also like you were talking about with essentially explaining it to other people, that's kind of, and I know you also do cars workshops in the course. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what that is. It's really our CARS workshops for that that we have in the course that you do that you know some of our other fantastic instructors do that I hop into every so often. We have students teach, right? We have them go through the passage, take turns, um, help each other out. If someone's stuck, right, they can ask a question to the instructor or in the chat. And it's really about if you can teach something, you understand it well. Because you can't teach something that you don't understand. If I were to sit here and I had never done a cars passage before and I tried to explain to you how to do one, it would not go well. (laughs) It would very much not go well. Um, Same if I hadn't, you know, seen physics in in five, 10 years, I can't really help you with it. So being able to explain to others, whether it's people that are studying for the MCAT, whether you're like me and you have a parent who will just listen to you talk, even though they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, you can hear yourself and hear when you're getting stuck and hear when you're saying something that, oh, I actually don't think that makes sense. I'm going to have to go back and check. can be really powerful. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I love that you're bringing up, you know, if you have people around you that will just hear, listen to you talk. First of all, that is so sweet. I'm glad that you have that in your life as I, and I will also happily do that for you. If you ever <laughs> want to just talk out loud, you know, I'm a, I'm a phone call away. Um, and you know, this is funny because I was teaching a, um, how to study uh, mm-hmm. free trial session, a free class on our website. Um, and I had brought this up as a way that, you know, is really so valuable to cement understanding. Um, and I had said, you know, Hey, it's a great way, right? Go try and teach it to someone. Because again, just like you said, you recognize the places where while teaching, you're like, (laughs) wait, actually, I don't know about that. Um, and especially when you have people that can ask you follow-up questions, especially, um, it'll be a really great highlight on weak areas if they're there. Um, but I had a student who threw in the chat, like, 
yeah, I don't, I don't really have anyone that I can study with very easily, but I use this anyways. And what I do is I just teach my stuffed animals. They're like, you know, I've got a bunch of stuffed animals that I had since I was a kid. And they now are studying for the MCAT with me. <laughs> like, sure, it's great to have people that can respond back to you, but you don't even need it. It's the process of trying to simplify complex topics that really will make the difference with studying. You saying that just reminded me, I have had students who have talked to their dogs um, and have mm-hmm. taught to their pets. I had one student <laughs> dr- draw on a on a piece of paper a tape up to the wall, just like a cartoon person. I'm like, yes, teach to that cartoon person. That is do what it. you need to do. I there love it. Um, so we, we support active studying. We support um, being engaged when you study and doing that regardless of the resources that you may have um, access to, which also really quick plug, our academic advisors are a fantastic resource. If you're listening to this and you're like, okay, I need I need to figure out kind of what my general game plan is going to be over the MCAT cycle, over the application cycle, um, like our free trial sessions. They are a free resource that we provide you guys because we want to see people from all backgrounds succeed in, um, in the MCAT. So that's really important to us. So you've told us about how you set up your study plan. You told us about the actual process and um, <laughs> the, the very... A very expensive iPad elevator. <laughs> but how yeah. did you how did you how did you ultimately practice like questions? Because we know that that's so important and students do so many of them. Yeah, I love this. And this is actually something that I have some very strong feelings about, <laughs> right? Because yeah, I mean, learning something from a textbook and being able to explain it to another person, that's amazing. That's building understanding, right? And that's very, very important. But the MCAT is not a test where you sit down and you explain something to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we're studying and preparing for the structure of the test that we need to take, right? So practice questions are a really important piece of this, right? And it gives you a chance to test your understanding of the concepts you've been learning and also to build critical thinking strategies that can help you get those you know, questions correct that ultimately will help determine your score. Um, but it also brings up this issue of price, right? To go and buy subscriptions to uh, QBanks or to, um, you know, buy the textbooks that have the end of chapter questions, it adds up, right? And this yeah. is actually one of the reasons why I'm actually here and why, um, you know, I work at Jack Weston full time. This is why, this is my why is because I was working throughout this whole process, right? Yeah. Because I needed to pay for rent and food and MCAT prep resources, right? Um, And the fact that so many people make so much money off people that just have a need, um, it it doesn't sit right with me. Um, So it it speaks to me so much how many free resources we have on our website, right? The only resource as far as practice questions go that you need, right, is AEMC. You can't substitute that out. And if you ever are chatting with someone who says you don't need to do AMC questions, don't listen to them. <laughs> don't, don't, yep. right? Because they are the people who take your exam or who write your exam, right? That you will take the exam with. Um, so for me, right, when I was starting to integrate my practice questions, again, I mentioned I did do Jack Weston cars passages. <laughs> um, so I, I was getting some extra cars practice. Um, but ultimately what I did was, I used all of the AMC resources um, and it's not like I just ran through them once and called it a day. I didn't do them all six times each. I did every question at least once. I think I did do section bank twice. Um, Obviously it's a a real tough one. You want to make sure you know that well, but (laughs) I spent so much time reviewing every single question and passage that I did. Right. And to be honest, after having worked with so many students um, throughout my time at Jack Weston, right, that is what makes the difference between someone who scores a 490 and a 500 or a 500 and a 510 or a 510 and a 521, right? It's a it's a depth issue. It's not a, a quantity issue, right? Doing 9,000 practice questions, which we have those on our website for free. You can use them. 
just doing 9,000 practice questions is not going to get you the score that you want, right? It's the depth to which you unpack those questions and really get to the bottom of why was this answer wrong? Why were the other ones, or why was this answer right? Why were the other ones wrong? How was I supposed to be thinking in order to get this question correct, right? What information did I use from the passage? What information did I use from my head? What skills did I employ to get this question right or wrong, right? That depth, I will tell you, it takes a while. That is what makes the difference. And I want to get avoid getting too in-depth on how to review. <laughs> I know you just did a, a, a podcast episode about this, but go listen, everyone, if you haven't already. <laughs> this is, to me, the biggest determinant of your MCAT score is how much time you will set aside for personal growth and learning, right? Because that's when the real learning happens, right? Because it integrates your content knowledge, your skills, your critical thinking uh, abilities, right? It all ties in when you start doing practice passages and practice questions. I know that the three of us have talked about this so much and in terms of student learning and whatnot, um, you'd think that you were at, like you were here on the podcast when Phil and I talked about this, (laughs) because there was just, it's, it's the same, right? Because it's so true. And hopefully hearing it from three different folks who, you know, are immersed in the world of MCAT, who've gone through, who have made mistakes, who, you know, want you to to not make the same mistakes, hearing that same thing of the importance of review, hopefully that's making it stick because that truly is what will help you improve. And like you mentioned, Molly, you know, you the AMC material is non-negotiable. To be very clear, everyone in our course Yes, we provide additional to people who are not in the course and students who are in the course, right? They will get homework assignments. Everyone will be assigned a all of the AMC material because yes. nothing is going to beat that on test day. Here at Jack Weston, we absolutely do our best to match it as much as possible. At the end of the day, no one, no third party is AMC test writer, right? So that's really important to keep in mind. That said, you mentioned the Jack Weston daily passages uh, for CAR specifically. So I just want to make sure students know because surprisingly, students, some students know about us with respect to CARs, but not always the sciences. Mm-hmm. So for CARs, we have our free daily passage. So every day you get a new CARs passage. For the sciences, we have the fundamentals, we have the AMC style, uh, AMC style passages, and those again are daily. So there is no shortage of practice available to you. The question is what you will do with that practice that has been made available to you. Yeah, and I love that you bring up our our daily science passages and our daily science (laughs) street sets because um, as we mentioned before, right, I do a ton of instruction here at Jack Weston, but I'm also in charge of the content that we create. Um, And we've been in a big push lately of making our free science content as useful to students as Mm -hmm. possible because all these practice questions, right? To, to get it from anyone else, right? They charge an arm and a leg and it's just getting more and more expensive, right? One thing that we've been focusing on lately is, okay, just having high quality questions and passages is not enough because ultimately, right? Me and Azai and Phil, we all talk about how important a review is and making sure you really understand how you should have been thinking for this question and making sure you have the content that you need for this. Um, And specifically, we've been working very diligently to make sure that our solutions are updated and that they provide those necessary learning opportunities. So this actually was a huge project for us, right, to brainstorm what is the best way for students to structure a review, right? And we we ultimately are working to make sure that all of our content on our website has those learning opportunities outlined for you um, because it, it can be tough to know where to start, right? And again, go watch the video. You'll get more information, but I love that you bring that up because, um, you know, I, I didn't have access to daily science passages when I was studying, but I absolutely would use them now. <laughs> Right. It's a great way to get exposed. And uh, again, the the quality of the resources, something that we're constantly working to make as high as high as it physically can be for all of you guys. Yeah, there's one other thing that I want to, to mention, um, because I think 
from from what I'm hearing, both you, Phil, myself, we were all, you know, working. We finances played a role in how we how we approached our studying. Um, I want to let students know. So first, if you think that you could qualify for the fee assistance program that the AMC offers, please apply for it. Okay, this is incredibly Early. important um, for Canadian students. If you have a U.S. address, you can apply. Uh, so that's something that. Uh, the AMC has more information on their website and the fee assistance program webpage about. For the students that do get the fee assistance program for the AAMC, um, connect with one of our academic advisors and they can help make the course accessible financially. And so that's something that I don't know of any other, honestly, I don't know of any other uh, company that does this, but I just want to make sure that you guys know that that's a possibility because I know that that was a huge barrier um, and that can be a huge barrier for some folks. So we're we're doing our best to make sure that we break down those barriers. Um, like yes, we we need to we need to pay our, our staff, but we also want to make sure that like you guys get the best quality resources at at a um basically at a, in a way that is affordable, but also providing these, all of these free resources. And I, I joked one time, I sat down, I was like, I think we have more free resources than premium resources, quite frankly. Oh, I think I we do. We do, we do, for sure. Yeah. Um, so if, if you need help navigating, figuring out all of the bajillion resources that Jack Weston has available, uh, both free and um, premium. In either case, connect with an academic advisor. They can let you know what we have and how to make the best use of it. Because we, like Molly, like you said, there are so many areas where we wish we would have done things differently, had access to things that we didn't have access to at the time. And so just having all of these resources, it can be overwhelming to know where to start. Those are the folks that can help you um, make your personalized study scheduler with you or your um, kind of general approach with you in it. And then I know for our course students, we have the adaptive study scheduler, which is truly tailored to each individual student and the time they have available uh, for studying and what their goal is. So make sure that you are in your study schedule. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. And I love that you bring up the academic advisors because honestly, they are such a gem. If we're talking right free and affordable resources, they are so amazing. Right? Mm -hmm. Just having someone to chat with and share mm -hmm. these are the these are the challenges that I'm facing right now. I don't I don't know what I need. I don't yeah. I don't know what sort of resources I need. I don't know what resources you have and and just having someone to talk with and be honest with of, I don't know what to do and that's okay, right? They're here to provide that guidance and that support. Um, go chat with Seda and Robert and Clark oh, and Ian and all of our amazing academic advisors. They are such gems of human beings, right? Yeah. So amazing, so supportive. Um, and they will help you figure out what resources you need, what resources you have access to, right? And ultimately help you figure out what what your next couple months is going to look like, right? And that is unparalleled. Honestly, I, I could sit here and talk about all the <laughs> amazing people that work with us for so long as I, because to be honest with you, and you mentioned, you know, part of our mission is to make these resources free and affordable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to, we need to pay our people, right? But that has never been a top priority for any of us. We're here because we, we want to support you, right? Yeah. We are here for you. We were, I, I could talk again about how much I love students for, for way too long, but <laughs> each of you guys listening to this podcast, right? We want you to know that you can be a doctor and we want you to be a doctor. We want you mm -hmm. to have the, the best resources in the entire world. We want to make them accessible to people of all backgrounds, right? Regardless of the different barriers that you could be facing, right? We are here for you. And we are constantly, I could say this because I'm, I'm involved in a lot of the instruction and the content. <laughs> we are constantly working to rethink the way that we present information. We are constantly, uh, you know, brainstorming new ways that we can yeah. provide resources and support for you. I can promise to myself <laughs> that I will not stop until all of you guys have every resource available to you, right? That you need to succeed on your exam. It's what drives me. It's what, it's what, you know, has me hopping out of bed every morning to come to work, 
right? It's because I want you guys to go on and succeed, right? And ultimately, I know Azai, you feel the same. Phil feels the same, right? Yeah. We are here for you. And that's that's why we're here, right? So thank you guys for being my inspiration. <laughs> Thank you for being mine. <laughs> Honestly, you just oh. do such a, such amazing work and students don't realize how much goes on behind the scenes, um, which is why we just, it was overdue having you on this podcast. It was honestly <laughs> very overdue about time. Um, yeah. And we're just really grateful for, for your time, for sitting and chatting with me. It's always just fun and great to talk with you in general. Yeah. Um, and hopefully our students can, can get a glimpse into the fantastic Molly. Um, you oh. can also <laughs> go to one of her free trial sessions when she does them um, and take a look at what quality learning is and, and get some of that active engagement. But thank you so much for, for joining us today, Molly. Yeah, it was so much fun to be on here again. I've been listening since day one. Um, and as I feel too, right, anytime you guys want to chat, you let me know um, because I I so appreciate both of you guys and all the things that you do for students. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to work alongside you. So thank you for having me on. This has been so much fun. 